Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to B-Sides Las Vegas. Uh, this talk is by Aaron. It's a, it is PowerPC Emulation and Transition. I got a few announcements before we start. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsor, our diamond sponsor, Adobe, and our gold sponsors, Prisma Cloud, SendGrip, PlexTrack. Uh, it's with their support that we're able to do this event and keep going next year. Uh, we also want to thank all of our donors, the volunteers, everybody. Uh, quick reminder about cell phones. If you have them in your pocket, please put them on silent. Uh, even the vibrate's really annoying, so please make sure it doesn't show up on our recording later. Um, if you have questions at the end, uh, there's a microphone by the projector there. Feel free to come up and ask them. Uh, Aaron said she'd be happy to take questions. Thank you so much. Five seconds while I remember to turn my phone on, vib on silent. There we go. All right, so let's get going. I am Aaron. Oh, I can't wander. Oops. Sorry, bad habits. We'll see how this goes. Uh, I am Aaron Cornelius or Acorn. Uh, take your pick. And if you want to know what the hell the thing in the bottom left is, go to onionshark.com. It's got a little background story there. Um, pronouns she, her. Um, I am, you know, I've been a, a Seen, I'm currently senior staff uh, security researcher or something like that at Grimm. I've been been at this job for a little over six years. In this particular job, um, I in this particular job, I do a lot of uh, you know uh, reverse engineering of hardware, software. Do vulnerability research. I do training development. I uh, give training. Um, one of the things that is one of my key thing, key passions. Sure, that'll work. Key passions is helping to teach people and helping to mentor people. And now I'm going to give all of you one of the things that I tell you something that I tell the people that I mentor, which is if somebody knows what they're talking about, if somebody sounds like they know what they're talking about, there's only three possibilities. One is that they're full of shit, which is an extremely popular option. Second one is that they've been working with that system, you know, software, wh whatever, for like three plus years. Last option is that they uh, made the thing, right? They created it. So they know everything about it. Probably everything. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to say up front here. If it sounds like some of these things are confusing and you're not familiar and it feels intimidating or for me or for anybody else speaking anywhere this week, just remember that after you have had experience doing the same thing for like three plus years, you'll also know things and you will know way more than people who've not had experience with it. So just some level setting there. So this talk is about emulation and PowerPC uh, and transition. We'll get to that. Um, we'll get to the story time in a little bit, but before we do that, I need to lay some technical uh, baseline here. Uh, why emulate something? Um, there's a couple different reasons. Uh, in my line of work, I specialize in cyber physical systems. Uh, so it's bare metal systems. We don't get quite as much visibility with the debugging. Uh, and so trying to attach JTAG debuggers to embedded systems can be problematic at times, or it can just be slow. I've worked with a lot of, you know, really weird architectures and really weird piece of crap debuggers, and they're slow, and they make everything kind of more annoying than it feels like it really should be. So that's one reason that, uh, you know, having an emulator can be handy. Uh, also, full system emulation provides a lot more opportunities for collecting information and for, uh, you know, especially for doing reverse engineering. The mm -hmm, slide, my notes. It can be in reverse engineering, for example, if you have a program that has tamper protections in it, right? Anti debug features. On Linux, uh, one of the common, one of the ways that you get debug access to a program is with the ptrace system call. So programs which uh, p T R A C E. Uh, the P trace system call. Um, so if the program itself wants to stop anybody else from debugging it, it can just call the P trace system call for itself and register as a debugger. Um, which means then that uh, nobody else will be able to debug that particular application. It'll be prevented from it. Uh, then, the, so then that program itself knows that if uh, once it registers for that, nobody else can attach after that. If it attempts to register and somebody else is already debugging the program, then the program knows immediately that it's being debugged and it can take the appropriate action to exit or whatever. To make my life annoying, basically. 
But if, the, if you have full system emulation, you don't have to rely on the real system calls, you can just return whatever information you want to return, right? You can just have, say, yeah, there's nobody else debugging this program, no problem, carry on. And the reason that it works fine, because you're not debugging it, right? You're not actually debugging it, you're emulating everything. Uh, there's a tool called Vivisect, which is going to be key in a little bit. And for Vivisect, uh, it uses emulation in some interesting ways. It's actually one of the ways that it finds uh, the finds what is and is not a function. It, it takes a block of code and attempts to de um, decode each instruction as it goes. And if it you know hits a proper return at the end of something, then it knows this is a valid function. That's how it, that's how it uses emulation to actually do disassembly. And also you can do kind of more targeted type reverse engineering where you take a function that has been found and you start emulating it and you fill up the registers, the emulated registers and memory with what's called a taint value, which then allows you to track what uh, results as the program goes are affected by those input values. And if all of a sudden you get a program counter that's set to like the taint value plus a certain value plus some other thing, then you know immediately that you've got code execution in this function if you can provide, if you can, you know, manipulate the input parameters. So, basically this all sums up as it's useful. So, there's a lot of other emulation tools out there where I'm, I'm making a new one. Uh, there's one called QMU, which is a very popular open source emulator. Uh, its code base is terrible. This is my personal opinion. Sometimes things just don't mesh well. Like, if you look at a code base that people have written, um, if any of you work do any sort of development whatsoever, you'll know that people have different development styles and sometimes they don't really play happy together. Like the way one person does things doesn't make sense to somebody else. That's just the way it works. People think about problems in different ways. So existing code bases don't make me happy. Um, if you, and also they can break. Like if you've ever tried to emulate a full system Raspberry Pi image, the last I tried to do that, it was actually fully broken, even though it was, I was trying to do a Raspberry Pi 3. And it's because the, uh, the Ethernet device, the emulated Ethernet device that tried to have you, the instructions I'll tell you to add, doesn't work. Um, so, you know, in the end also there's because I want to, right? There's something very valuable about making a new tool. You learn a lot about how things work, you, you know, and you gain new knowledge and expertise in the process. Uh, and also it was uh, my job. That one kind of overcomes the rest of them, but there's other good reasons too. PowerPC, I said this talk is emulation, PowerPC and emulation. PowerPC, why in the world does anybody using PowerPC? Who in the hell uses PowerPC anymore? Uh, and the answer is in embedded systems. Uh, a lot of, you know, cyber physical systems if you must be that way. Uh, and it's uh, very common in automotive, it's very common in aerospace. These industries have used it for a long time. Um, you know, at the time they started using these PowerPC chips back, you know, in the, you know, mid-90s, whenever they first were created. I didn't look up the timeline, it's been too long since I've done that. Uh, you know, why were they using PowerPC versus something else? Maybe there was a good technical reason at the time. Uh, maybe it's basically because they want to, right? If some, if an industry uses a particular thing, if a company uses a particular platform and tool, they will just keep using it because that works, right? A uh, friend of mine says, if it works, don't breathe on it, don't fucking touch it, otherwise it's going to break, right? So if it, this system works and they know how to debug it and they know how to develop for it, they will keep using that same exact platform. So short answer is they use it because they have used it. Um, there isn't a whole lot that actually does emulation for PowerPC. Uh, there's a few things, QMU does provide some. But uh, you can emulate like an early 2000s Mac with uh, QMU. But when we started this process, I haven't checked recently, but when we started this process, any of the standard open source debug uh, emulation tools, uh, they did not support some of the newer, I should probably put some quotes around that, newer PowerPC features like VLE. Uh, VLE stands for variable length encoding. You can think of it very much like ARM Thumb 2. Um, so there's an entire instruction set that's not supported in the emulators. Um, and also there's additional custom features for some of the embedded controllers that is not really addressed within current emulation tools. 
Um, and um, again, you know, uh, very much like the last slide, it was also part of what I was assigned. I was assigned to make an emulator for PowerPC. So here we are, right? What project was I assigned to? Oh yeah, DARPA AMP program. I almost forgot to put it down there. So DARPA AMP program itself, um, I'm not going to go and read a bunch of stuff to you. You can look at the web page right there if you want. Uh, it stands for Assured Micro Patching. Um, and you can read about it if you want more detail. Because I've already gone on too long without getting to the story, I will give you a very quick summary of what AMP is about. The goal here is to, uh, the, this part project is to, the goal is to make, um, create or advance the state of the art in tools that will take a binary and lift it up into high level language, let you modify that high level program, whether it's C or something like C, and then take that modified program, recompile it back into a binary, and then take the original binary and then patch it in, in a way that's unobtrusive to the actual program execution. The very last, and most challenging, in my opinion, part of this project is to provide to make those tools be able to provide assurance that the uh, you know the changes that are made don't negatively impact the behavior of the program. So that's you know what's been going on. Um, I'm not going to be going into details about the, these particular tools because that's not really what I've been working on. Right? That's the overall goal of the program. There's a lot of other tools that have been uh, talked about this year. Previous years, um, like OFRAC from Red Balloon last year, uh, uh, Fish is going to be doing a talk about anger, and anger's been making. There's been a lot of changes going on with that. that. I think that's a DefCon talk. Um, but there's a there's a bunch of different tools that are used in the industry for doing disassembly and reverse engineering, and as well as new tools being created as a result of this program, doing some really cool stuff. And that wasn't what I was working on. What I was working on is testing those tools. So part of the DARPA project is that there's a team that actually does a, um, so uh, there are companies AIS, Cummins, and Grimm were the team that actually is testing uh, and also, um, you know, with uh, some people from CSU uh, are the team testing those tools. The end goal is to be able to um, find bugs in a real embedded controller because Cummins is a partner. And that means that the end goal, the end test, is going to be on an engine, a real Cummins engine controller. A bug is going to be placed in it, needs to be found and patched, and they need to be able to verify with all the complexity of a modern engine controller that the patch made does not negatively, does not negatively impact it. Um, but this pro the tool, the processor in this controller is a modern, you know, for a given value of modern PowerPC chip which means that there were no emulators that actually did, the two, did what is necessary for this, uh, to emulate this beast. Uh, this is the particular chip and that engine controller, and it doesn't really, you don't have to look around and pay too much attention to this eye chart. This is just from the reference manual from NXP. Um, the things probably to point out here are that in that little yellow, I could probably, let me see here. Hey, hey it works. In this little yellow box here, um, you can see that it's got a couple different things. Here's VLE, we talked about that before, MMU, um, memory management stuff, virtual memory. There's also this block here called SPE2, and that's really annoying. SPE2 is an NXP proprietary component that implements custom floating point and vector instructions, which means even if there was a standard uh, emulator out there that did those things, we potentially need to be implementing new custom instruction decoding and emulation also. Um, so. You know, there's, there's, there was work to be done at the beginning there. And I'm going to show you this here. This is like the, I didn't add, I should have added up the number of pages all these reference manuals were. I think it's probably around 5,000 or more pages. Um, loads of fun. But thankfully, I didn't, it, it was a few year project, right? This is like three years that I've been doing this. Um, but I'm not going to dwell on here too much. If you have questions about, if you have technical questions about any of this stuff, obviously feel free to get a hold of me afterwards, and I'm happy, more than happy to talk about it. Um, so, almost to story time, but we're going to real, really quick mention this here, Conway's Law. I don't know if anyone's familiar with this particular, um, you know, I, not law, idea, concept. Uh, the idea is that any organization that designs a system will produce a design whose structure is a copy of how that particular organization communicates. 
If you've got four groups that are making a particular product, then you're going to end up having four individual subcomponents. And the way they talk together, the way they work together, is based on how those teams communicate with each other. So, um, and, you know, in terms of at a, at a lower scale, I know this is true, you know, this should be fairly obvious because the way I write tools and, you know, write tools for myself is all based around how I think about problems, right? So the tools that I write work well for me and they let me look at the pieces of information that I find interesting during the, pro during the you know, while using the tool. This is also one of the reasons I encourage everybody to make their own tools um, because oftentimes the tools that are out there don't really mesh well and work for the way you think about problem solving. Or let's try to solve particular problems. So, you know, and like I said before, making your own tool will help you uh, you know, learn more about it in the process anyway. So, it's time for some story. We'll talk about uh, the kind of how the, you know, how, what the work that was done on the emulator, um, the different challenges that were there. Uh, by now, I, you know, assume it's obvious that I'm trans when I say figuring myself out. Um, whoops, what was that? Figuring myself out. Did I miss one? Whoops, oops. <laughs> All right, I'm not sure what that note was all about. I must have typoed something here. I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty of a bunch of things because I don't have the time for it um, and things can get a little personal. Um, and also this talk is already way more personal than anything I've ever done before. And I've been a little bit nervous about that. Hopefully it's not coming off too badly. We'll see. I'm sure I'll find out afterwards. So what do making an emulator and PowerPC and you know, coming out as trans have to do with anything? Nothing. They're not related. Well, okay. I suppose PowerPC and the emulator are related to each other. Um, you know, coming out as, you know, coming out as trans is more of a, uh, just a thing that happened at the same time as the other things. I was started on this project. Well, let's start here, right? So start, here's the beginning. Um, this is the only surviving selfie I ever actually tried to take here, uh, take of myself before coming out. I have no idea how it wasn't deleted. Um, it's only really relevant in this particular situation because this is around the same time that I started thinking more in depth about, you know, myself and like gender, do I have one, etc. cetera. Um, it's worth mentioning right here that I don't mind old pictures of myself and this is, uh, this is, can be extremely personal for trans people and it's as, uh, so don't assume uh, anybody you talk to is okay with, you know, looking at old pictures or t showing people old pictures of themselves, right? It's an extremely personal thing. Um, personally, it doesn't look like me and it never felt like me. So, you know, it's kind of more of an abstract thing. Only reason I find old pictures kind of interesting is because uh, how much, how different they look for me now. It's also worth mentioning that this is probably around the time that um, at this time I'd already figured, learned that I was ADHD diagnosed as an adult. Um, and I was slowly learning how that impacted me in terms of, you know, how, how that uh, impacted life, I guess, for me. It's probably the most generic way to say it. Um, you know, the story is about kind of emulation and PowerPC. It's also essentially a part, you know, the undercurrent of all this is related to reverse engineering. We're developing an emulator because it needs to be emulated for this particular program that we're working on. But we're doing the emulator in a particular way because it also should help us be able to, um, you know, be able to use this tool in the future for doing reverse engineering, right? This is the one reason we structured it the way we did, so we can get additional analysis and information from it. Part of this is essentially me looking at the patterns in myself, you know, in mentally, and slowly reverse engineering essentially myself and my own brain. So enough of this, let's move on. Summer 2018. Uh, you know, work started on the PowerPC support in Vivisect, which I talked about. Power Vivisect is a reverse in, uh, uh, vulnerability research tool, vulnerability research toolkit, something like that. I always forget the specific words. Uh, there's also another coworker at this time created a PowerPC VLE disassembler plugin for Binary Ninja. That's up on that GitHub address there. Vivisect, which I should have put the address there, um, also is that like github.com slash vivisect slash vivisect. So uh, let's see. 
Oops, not that. Uh, the next thing here, winter, summer, this, you know, kind of improvements were made. The initial project, not a whole lot of progress was made initially because work seemed to keep getting in the way. Go figure. Um, you know, eventually then, kind of the next year, uh, Grim got an award from NMFTA to officially add an improved PowerPC support to Vivisect. Because PowerPC is so common in transportation, they were trying to kind of push forward a bit of the state of the art in terms of, you know, tools for doing vulnerability research and, um, you know, disassembling PowerPC and embedded systems. I didn't help with the initial stuff, um, but I did make a load of unit tests for it. I made it the way I always do things, which is I script it. So I took an existing program, I found all the instructions in the program, and then I dumped those out with an existing tools, and I made a giant file of tests to run through and like verify that the disassembly was correct. And I found a lot of bugs uh, in both our tool and in uh, the commercial tools because there's bugs everywhere. All right, anyway. So next, uh, here's the last picture I have before the pandemic started, before I started growing my hair out. Um, I had always wanted to grow my hair out, but it, for some stupid reason, I felt that uh, I should look professional instead, um, which was stupid, but you know, that's kind of where I was at the time. Uh, it, with regardless of all the other completely terrible things that have happened due to the pandemic, um, at the very least, it was a good excuse for me not to grow, not to cut a haircut. I'd been working at Grimm for about three years at this point, um, and I'd mostly overcome my initial imposter syndrome. I hadn't fully grown in confident in my own abilities to like teach and mentor at that time. Um, also more mental progress type stuff. I'd already figured out that I was probably autistic at this point. Um, as a result of that, it didn't really change anything too much. It's more along the lines of helping me realize that there's certain situations and like physical, you know, noise levels or whatever that become over completely overwhelming for me. And um, instead of trying to like power through it and push myself through those things, I realized it's much easier and healthier. And in the long, in the short term and long term, I recover quicker if I just take a moment, go find a quiet corner to chill out in you know, kind of reset myself and then I can get back to whatever I was doing, right? So it's more of a self-care type uh, process. Um, you know, say uh, poor Erin here had no idea what was in store for her uh, in the next few years. Uh, at this point, I was pretty sure I was non-binary at some point, um, but I'd also decided that gender was all bullshit anyway, so who the fuck cares? Um, I do wanna emphasize very much right here that just because somebody feels, says they're non-binary, it doesn't mean it's like intermediate state. It's very much for me at this time, it was just easier for me to accept non-binary rather than accepting that I was, you know, trans woman. Um, and, you know, that's just because honestly, I wasn't, I wasn't ready yet. Uh, it took a while for me to be able to accept myself. But the, you know, thinking I was non-binary was less scary. Uh, but yeah, very much so. I just want to repeat that one more time again, that, you know, people who say they're non-binary, you know, they're non-binary, right? It's, it's not like they're not yet decided. That was just, for me, the way my brain was thinking. So, summer 22, um, the DARPA AMP program finally kicks off. And my, some of my colleagues started working on the emulator work. I had not joined yet. Uh, I was working on a different project. Um, my colleague, uh, Matt, created the initial emulator framework along with defining like the memory mapped IO reads and writes that would allow plugging like generic uh, peripherals to do like certain actions to happen when you read and write memory. Uh, if you're familiar with how low level embedded systems work, when you read certain memory, it lets you like read a message that's been received. If you write memory to a certain specific memory address, it allows uh, like messages to be sent over a network. Uh, the type of network and the addresses you read and all that junk are part of the reference manual. So you just got to look it up depending on what you're working on. Um, late fall, um, I started helping Matt with the PowerPC emulator, which was really at that point was a lot of learning how Vivisect itself works and how the emulator's capabilities in Vivisect was, worked, was working. In December, we hired a new junior researcher also uh, who didn't have a lot of, uh, Jordan, who didn't have much experience with doing assembly or even or programming Python, but he said he wanted to learn. And so uh, for a lot, much of the next year or so, I was helping mentor him to, you know, teach him how to do Python and how assembly works, how to decode instructions and so on and so forth. 
I don't think he's too pissed off at me for teaching him PowerPC as his very first assembly language. I hope. I do feel a little bad about it. So, software watchdog timer. That's what SWT is. That's kind of the first peripheral that was made. The, one of the benefits is that it forced us to kind of come up with the way we're going to manage the tracking of time. When a, part, when a system boots up, it tracks like how many, you know, system clock ticks have occurred. So this was the first go at it. Um, we tried to come up with some way that was efficient. It did kind of bite us a little bit in the end, but it was good enough to start with. Uh, that's often what you need to do when you're developing a complex system. Next thing that was done, SIU, which is, stands for System Integration Unit, and FMPLL, which is Frequency Modulated Phase Lock Loop. Again, these are just words, garbage words from the reference manual. You don't have to care what they mean, but they're related to basically getting the system to power up and getting the initial things to behave properly and getting the initial system clock to be set. So, with those three things done, we were ready to actually start emulating the real code, right? So, I have a 2350, same 2350 boot uh, that was on my desk, cracked it open, attached a debugger to it, and ripped the firmware out of it. I mean, strictly speaking, I did have another firmware image already, but this one was useful because it was, um, I like having duplicates of things. It helps me confirm how things behave. And also, because I got the debugger hooked up, I was, I was able to, even though, Hardware debugging is annoying and can be clunky and less easy than having an emulated thing to run. Uh, it is a nice way, nice to be able to actually hook up a debugger and confirm that when these particular values are set, that the correct things that my emulator is doing the same behavior as the real thing itself. Like I'm able to read the correct values, I'm able to see messages be transmitted and so on. So. Uh, let's see, that year, so that was kind of the, you know, that was lead up to May. Next thing that happened here, I had a talk at SCAR in 2021. Uh, it was held virtually, obviously. This was a professional headshot that my partner took for me. Uh, my girl going my hair out was going pretty well at that point. Um, you know, and at this point, I'd kind of come around to the idea that, yeah, maybe I wanted to be a woman at some point, but like, so what? Gender's all bullshit anyway, right? Uh, it's not like, in my thought, was very much. I'm old now, so who cares? It's not like it's worth doing at this point in my life. Um, at least that's where my mind was. You probably know how this story ends, uh, but I'm going to emphasize how very, very wrong I was about that thing, about it being too old and being not worth it. Next, there was a lot of work that was done in May. It was kind of easy when we didn't have a whole lot of framework to worry about because the more things that were added, the more complicated adding new things in became. And then we also kind of chose what things to add initially because those were the, like the basis of how a lot of other things needed to work in the system. So MMU is how you configure uh, for virtual memory addresses. It's also on PowerPC, fun fact, that the, um, these are special purpose registers because everything in PowerPC is special purpose registers. Um, that's one of the things that makes it kind of annoying. But over here, this uh, I can't, MMU assist register two, something like that, yeah. These flags here are the ones that control whether or not a certain page of memory is VLE. And uh, so if you want to know which parts of memory in a PowerPC system are VLE versus the regular 32-bit instructions, you have to have the MMU configuration. It doesn't have like a simple bit flag like it does in ARM. Also, fun fact, in PowerPC systems, you can configure the different pages of memory to be big or little endian. This has no real relevance whatsoever. This is just one of those things that annoyed the shit out of me when I was trying to emulate this damn thing. So over here you see this E flag, that's the Endian flag. So just, you know, just in case you ever want to mess around with things and make terrible, terrible PowerPC uh, CTFs, um, you can have a lot of fun with these things because nobody knows this or realizes these things. Next, made flash. Uh, you don't have to worry about the, you know, again, you don't have to worry about this flash block layout. This is just kind of the layout from the reference manual. Um, if you're not familiar with how flash works in embedded systems, you generally have to erase blocks before you can actually write new values to them, uh, which meant that to emulate how the system works, because this is an engine controller, and the way it takes updates over the CAN bus, and there's a dealer tools uh, that then are able to send new programs to it. And if we're doing vulnerability research on this thing, we absolutely want to pay attention to how new programs are written into it and how we can manipulate and affect that. So I wrote Flash emulation. Now this is um, 
to kind of track and follow the prop proper process for uh, erasing and you know rewriting memory. This is also how I very first my bricked my very first virtual image because uh, I started everything up and ran it, and then uh, everything was going great. Every, uh, the Flash program configuration worked perfectly, and then the program, the you know the, the engine controller program, reached a point where it was looking for some information for something I hadn't implemented yet, and so it took some error path, and the error path had it go down and update Flash to indicate that this image is bad and it needs to take an update. And then every single time I booted the system after that, my you know, say booted, ran the emulator after that, every single time it stopped working. Like I couldn't get the same code flow that I had before and it took me an embarrassingly long time to realize that, wait a minute, something's different here. And I took, got a new fresh image off of the real hardware and compared it and realized that yes, in fact, this one here has some flags set that are not set in here. Um, so, uh, that was kind of fun because it helped confirm that yes, I was emulating Flash correctly. Uh, it was also kind of frustrating because I didn't even consider that a possibility at all. I really should have, but go figure. Uh, interrupt handling exceptions. These are things like if you get a divide by zero error, or if you get like if something tries to read memory address that doesn't exist, right? Those you get these kind of low base level exceptions. In a standard operating system, those exceptions are kind of translated into error signals that are sent to the program that's running at the time. Bare metal systems, it's not, it's like there's just one giant application running, which means that it might install handlers for those things. Most of the time, for many of these things, uh, the people programming the system assume that, you know, know that this isn't going to happen because it's not doing anything, you're not like loading new things on there after the fact, right? You load the program on and it does the same thing every time you boot it for however many years you're going to turn, you're going to use this particular controller. So these don't all have to be implemented for embedded systems, um, but the framework has to be there because that framework is still used for things like getting notifications when a message arrives on a particular, you know, communications bus. A few more peripherals here. Um, if you don't know about CAN, feel free to stop by the Car Hacking Village at DEF CON. We have lots of fun teaching people how to do CAN. Um, SPI is Serial Peripheral Interface. Um, a to, a, you, the Wikipedia page is pretty good for, uh, S, for learning how to uh, spy works. ADC is Analog to Digital Conversion. That's basically taking a voltage value and translating it into something that can be read, um, typically a fixed point number of some sort. EBI stands for external bus interface, is how like you can add external RAM to the particular part. Um, let's see. Uh, most embedded systems uh, that have all these different peripherals are called system on chips or SOCs. And they also usually have internal memory, uh, some internal SRAM, but typically they also have a way to add in extra memory. Um, and then I've got here summer to winter, lots and lots of integration, right? This kind of, you know, this kind of us goes through a bunch of these things here from August on, uh, trying to take one of the real challenges that was developed and given to the different teams or demonstrated to different teams and trying to make sure, see how it works all together in the emulator itself. It was basically a lot of work developing these things and, you know, um, like a month or so in August, and then after August, uh, going through and, you know, trying to fix all the bugs that I wrote or things I did incorrectly. How do we test these things? Make coming up with the tests because these are, it was all fairly complex. It's probably worth noting. Uh, I think it was around October 2021 that one of the people I follow on Twitter just made a random mention that uh, having trouble with long, forming long-term uh, memories is, can be a symptom of CPTSD. Uh, up until that point, um, I had kind of assumed it was because I was ADHD and just didn't pay close attention to things. Um, but, you know, uh, it was now, my mind was open to the fact that there is another possibility, right? Um, so I started trying to figure out, grapple with the idea that maybe I did have CPTSD and what did that mean? Uh, some addition to vivisect analysis to make it easier to do raw PPC firmware analysis with the tool. Um, and then February 2022, the emulator was moved to GitHub and released for the teams to use. It wasn't complete yet, but it was complete enough for people to start using it and manipulating it and playing around with it. 
Um, I should probably, I did forget to mention these slides will be up on my webpage that was at the very beginning, onionshark.com, um, but they're not there yet. They will be. Um, so also in early February, I finally accepted myself, you know, that yes, I probably was trans, came out to my partner. Uh, this is one of those things that when looking back on this particular timeline of how that what the per work that was done in the emulator was realized that it was very, uh, there's some weird time coincidences here, right? In this particular case, this is one of them. Um, so you'll notice from here, we're kind of getting a little bit less populated with technical stuff. Honestly, it's because most of the hard technical things were done earlier on, uh, but also because uh, we're running out of time. <laughs> this talk is very much in danger of going on too long. So 20 March, February, I came out to my partner. That's the picture of myself that I took the day after I came out. Um, it was really weird, it was like a switch flipped and all of a sudden I looked at myself and I was like, maybe this isn't the worst thing I've ever seen in the world. Before that, it definitely, definitely was. So then March, I had the very first week of March, I had a training to teach at the company I work for, Grimm, and I had to decide how I wanted to be. Did I want to be me? Did I want to be the you know, person that people had been seeing for three plus years at this particular point? I very much knew how my brain works and that if I didn't come out immediately, it would never feel like the right time. Um, so I was kind of felt like maybe I should do it for that. And also because I was happy. I was happy for like the first time in my life. Um, and I wanted to share the reason for it. Um, I knew there were some people I follow on Twitter who came out publicly and I got a lot of inspiration from them. So I thought maybe if I can be more public that it might be inspiring to other people. Um, also, my first work trip after coming out was at the end of March, which was for the AMP program, where we went to CSU and were testing a bunch of tools, and it laid right on top of March 31st, Trans Day of Visibility. So that was kind of also a very symbolic thing where it was like, well, I'm not, I hadn't actually worn like a skirt you know, professionally at that point. That was very much a, let's just fucking do this thing. Um, I was extremely nervous, but you know, I'd already come out professionally, came out LinkedIn, Twitter, to my company. Um, so, you know, all the people I've been working with for, you know, at that point, about one and a half years, you know, I came out to them and it was incredible. I've actually got a smile on my face, as you can see here. It was a good day. Uh, next thing, uh, at my, I had a talk at SCAR. So again, a year after that one professional headshot, I had another one that had to be taken. Um, and uh, so my partner, helped me with makeup. Um, I'm still not fantastic at it, uh, but I definitely wasn't at that time. And then took this picture from me, which um, frankly, I found astonishing. And this last one here, placeholder peripherals, that's because some things just can't be nice and give and we can never have good things. There's a part, a little peripheral in the processor called the uh, eTPU2. And the eTPU2 of this particular, you know, NXP processor is actually two tiny little DSPs that run their own instruction language and there's shared memory where you can populate some programs in there and have them do like automatic analysis of PWM inputs or ADCs or whatever. Which was a future problem because we couldn't deal with it at that time. Um, that's making an entirely new emulator for a completely different architecture was a little bit above and beyond what we planned on having to do. But so more work continued there. Um, there was a lot more work with some of the other challenges coming on. DEF CON 30 last year, I was there as myself. It was amazing. My friend uh, Heather took this picture. It was fantastic. Um, I told you before, like in October, I was talking, I was re reflecting on not remembering much of my life. And here very much uh, the last, since I have come out, I remember, it feels like everything and there's so many things that have happened. It's crazy wrap up a few more things here. We had a few more floating point instructions to make, um, including those proprietary ones, not just the PowerPC standard ones. Then we had to make some vi uh, vector instructions. Um, Jordan helped with the floating point instructions. Uh, another colleague, Dan, helped with the uh, vector instructions um, and testing them. SMs, like a very simple system identification module, like a unique ID in every processor type stuff. Uh, DMA and interrupts, so we already talked about interrupts. DMA is a way to attach like automatic memory reads and writes to just certain events that can be configured. Um, that also is, and again, another step of complexity for this particular project. Oh, shit. 
I just remembered something. I've got a demo video here. It looks extremely faint right there, but you'll very soon see it start scrolling. Um, there's not a whole lot to demo for this particular thing because it's an emulator and, de and the thing running is actually just like a lot of text flying by on the screen here, as you can see. No, not there. Hmm. Let's see. There you go. All right, it's going. Better late than never. I meant to start that earlier after we like went in the bootloader. You know, I grabbed that when I grabbed the firmware off of the thing. So it's running a little bit late. Um, there you can see lots of text flying by, which is going to be completely meaningless and is really only interesting to me, but I'm going to show you that anyway. <laughs> but here at this point, we're getting pretty close to being complete in terms of what is necessary to emulate the entire application. Last thing here, we've got, we added a remote GDB server. Um, this was, uh, we never had time to, this was initially created in the beginning of March, uh, but then we never really had time to fully integrate it into the, uh, into the actual emulator itself. The benefit of this is you can start up the emulator and give it a flag and say, wait until a debugger attack or remote GDB remote session attaches, and then you can continue to debug. Um, this is very much like if you have external hardware and you have a, some sort of debug server there. This is also very much like if you are running QMU with the dash G flag to let it pause until the debugger attaches. This whole emulator was intended to be somewhat of a drop in replacement for those types of workflows. And it's getting there. Did have to tweak the timing, have to make that took a little bit uh, longer. The external watchdog here is kind of the culmination of, you know, what culmination of the goal from the beginning where we had these layers of emulation happening, where Vivisect is kind of the core disassembly and emulation, and then we have this E200 Z7 emulator, and then there's the SOC we're emulating, then we're emulating like the PCB of the system itself. In this case, a watchdog is a thing that like, if you has to be like, you have to read or write to it or something every so often, or else the system resets. It's a way to make sure that software is still working properly. Typically, safety critical systems or, you know, real-time control systems have, um, have watchdog configured so that as you, you know, you've got like internal ones and then you also usually have one on the board level where maybe things are working okay internally, but there's an application level stuff that's supposed to happen. And if that application level stuff freezes up, then the external watchdog will, you know, restart everything also. So just different ways of recovering from errors. And then... That gets us to where we are right here at the end of May, uh, June. I think technically that was the end of phase two of the DARPA project, now going into phase three. Um, if you're not familiar with the terminology here in, for DARPA projects, um, phase three, the DARPA projects typically have three phases. There's the phase one, which is kind of the prove, that, you know, ba a basic, you know, prove you can do this thing. Um, phase two then is like actually do the work so phase one would be like proof of concept. Phase two is do the work. Phase three is what they call the transition phase, <laughs> um, where in, they're transitioning from kind of mostly for DARPA funding to being partially funded from external companies as well who are find interest in these technologies and tools being built and are able to carry them on. There's a bunch of stuff that still needs to be done on this, um, but in the end, you know, we're getting closer. My goal is to have this be able to be a generic framework for doing any bare metal emulation and have, being able to do this in a simple way. Vivisect is all written in Python. Emulator is all written in Python. Does mean there's some performance penalties for, uh, for it, um, but in general, it is one of those things that kind of makes it easier and faster to develop and hopefully easier for people to use in uh, whatever shape, form, or shape is helpful. Um, so there's still things to be done, but if you're changing less than like 10% of the functionality of something, then basically you're already done. People can use it and you can go about fixing it and tweaking things, you know, as you have time. So conclusion here, uh, emulator framework that works well for me. I, uh, works well for doing reverse engineering. Um, it works well with the way my brain works. Um, provides a bunch of different ways to do analysis. So like every time a function is called, you can see this text flying by here, there's a lot of debug statements, but there's also a lot of like function called, function exited, function called, function exited, log messages, which you can't see because it's too fast. <laughs> You'll have to trust me on that one. Um, and those are basically, those are there because of an analysis hook, which is every time you start a function, 
here, you know, here's that you can add a function call to start doing additional things. Every time the function returns, you can do additional things. At the, whenever an instruction is going to be, before an instruction is emulated, you can add additional hooks. After an instruction is emulated, you can add an additional hooks. This is one of the benefits of Vivisect as a framework. I've learned a ton about uh, disassembly and emulation. Um, I knew, I had knew some going in, but way more now than I used to. I also know more about Vivisect because I had never used the tool before. Um, I've also learned more about PowerPC than I ever wanted to know. Most of my career was in embedded systems, doing like uh, telecom, aerospace, medical, etc. And PowerPC is used in a lot of those things. And I um, thought I knew about PowerPC and I've learned more, more than I ever wanted to know. So don't be afraid to make your own tool and to research things, even if it's already been done before. But we got more conclusions. I actually like being me for the first time in my life. Um, and I seem to enjoy life, which is not an experience I ever thought I would have before. Um, it is very much never too late to love yourself. It's never too late to be yourself. Um, I cannot, I would not be able to state enough the difference between how I felt before and how I feel now, being able to stop, being able to just accept me and be me. Which very much at 45 minutes, almost exactly, takes us to the end. I guess I could probably stop that demo video at this point. Oh, oh um, a friend also said for the, when I was doing the first testing, I had a cat video here. So um, that was my test video that I did when I was uh, doing dry runs with a friend. And she said I should keep that in there. So it's a very cute video. I don't even remember where it's from, like a TikTok or something. I don't remember. A friend sent it to me. Uh, but anyway, so here, uh, back here where, um, any questions? Uh, I know we're kind of at the end of it now. So if you have questions and there's no time before they get us kicked out of here, please find me. I'm happy to answer questions about anything. Um, so thank you.